Welcome to module four, the integration of mental health and psychosocial support in case management. My name is Marie Diop and I work as a child protection specialist at UNICEF Eastern and Southern Africa Regional Office. This is the fourth module of the child protection area of responsibility, remote training and orientation for frontline workers delivering community-based MHPSS. In this module, I will speak about case management and the integration of MHPSS in case management. First, I will briefly remind the concept of MHPSS and the so-called MHPSS intervention pyramid. I will speak about the spectrum of MHPSS activities, which range from basic psychosocial support through community-based activities to the more specialized services provided by mental health professionals. Second, I would present the key components of case management, highlighting what case management and what case management is not. I will talk about the key principles, the key guiding principles that everyone who's doing case management work must consider before I then guide you through the various steps of the case management process. As this module was recorded during the COVID-19 pandemic, I will also speak about remote case management because over the last months, many social workers and many frontline workers like yourself have been enabled or are not allowed to do face-to-face -face case management because of lockdown and containment measures that limit their mobility. In this module, I will talk about the importance of integrating MHPSS into case management. I will unpack the relationship between case management and the four different layers of services of the MH pyramid of intervention. From the provision of PSS and community-based MHPSS services to the referral of children in need of specialized support. Before we start, if you're not yet familiar with the concept of mental health and psychosocial support, I recommend that you first visit Module 1 for a more in-depth introduction to MHPSS. So let us begin with a quick reminder of what MHPSS is. The term is used to describe any type of local or outside support that aims to protect or promote psychosocial well-being and to prevent or treat mental health conditions. The local support can consist of the community-based structures and mechanisms already in place to promote psychosocial well-being, whereas the outside support can consist of specialized service providers who are supporting when the local capacity to provide services does not meet the needs. Well-being can be described as the positive state of being when a person succeeds. It is the result of an interplay between physical, psychological, cognitive, emotional, social and spiritual aspects of a person's life. MHPSS is a term used to describe a wide range of services and support and a pyramid structure is usually used to present the different kinds of MHPSS services. This pyramid is commonly referred to as the MHPSS intervention pyramid. The base, which is also called the first layer of the MHPSS pyramid, is the largest, indicating that out of those who require MHPSS service, the majority will require this kind of support. The services become more specialized by each additional level of the MHPSS pyramid. 
and fewer people require the MHPSS services by each step up the pyramid. Overall, the fourth layer description pyramid of interventions describes the wide spectrum of support available to support those experiencing various degrees of mental health and psychosocial concerns. The level of support and the kind of MHPSS services that you should provide will depend on the individual needs of the children and the caregivers or families that you come into contact with. It is essential that the MHPSS services that you help provide are based on the access or sorry, are based on the assessed needs of the child. Considering risks and protective factors surrounding the child. More information about the socio-ecological framework are provided within module one. Through case management, you can support the MHPSS needs across all four layers of the MHPSS intervention pyramid. So why is MHPSS integration into case management important? As I'm recording, the COVID-19 pandemic is still having a heavy impact on the protection and well-being of children across the world. With schools being closed and with families losing their livelihoods because of the pandemic, children are at an increased risk of experiencing violence, exploitation, abuse and neglect. Some children might also be at home with abusive and violent parents that will affect both the physical safety and well-being of these children as well as their mental health. Children who are not experiencing violence or abuse might still experience high levels of stress due to the fear of being infected by the virus and fear of losing loved ones. Others will be impacted as their families can no longer afford to pay the rent or to sustain the whole family as they might have lost their jobs. COVID-19 has thus strengthened the need to integrate MHPSS among key service provided through case management. In order to understand how you can integrate MHPSS in case management, it is important to first understand what case management is. Case management is a process for identifying a child's need and coordinating the provision of services to meet those needs. This is done by the systematic assessment of needs, the development of a case plan and the implementation of the case plan in collaboration with service providers with a wide or from a wide range of actors. So case management is a process rather than a type of program or a specific intervention. In principle, for the case management process to function efficiently, it is vital that there is a national system in place to support those involved in the case management process. There should be clearly established forms to guide and document the case along all the steps of the process, including the registration, assessment, case planning, implementation, and referrals. In order to make referrals and the implementation of the case plan safe, it, it is vital that there are well-established data protection and information, information sharing protocols, as well as standard operating procedures for making referrals and for the safe storage of case uh, information. And overall, this is also part of child safeguarding policies. So all the elements I just mentioned 
the forms to document the case, information sharing and data protection, and information management system are part of the broad case management process. Case management focuses on the protection and needs of the child, supporting the well-being of the child by working with the family and with the community within the socio-ecological model. Any case management process should be part of, once again, as I already said, a national child protection system or build upon it, ideally. For more information about the core elements of case management, you can also consult the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian settings, as well as the notes on social service work for safety and well-being during COVID-19 response, recently issued under the coordination of the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. We will shortly go through the steps of case management in more detail and also talk about the integration of MHPSS in case management. But first of all, let us have a brief reminder about the guiding principles which must guide the work of everyone who works with children and anyone doing case management. As a frontline worker, this should already be at the core of your work. If you feel that you require more support or that you would benefit from more uh, capacity building on case management, you should consult your manager as well as the list of resources provided at the end of this module. Let us go through the guiding principles for engaging with children and for conducting case management. The guiding principles that I will describe now are a core set of principles which should guide your behavior and interactions with children and their families. First, there is do no harm. In short, this means that any actions and interventions you take to support the child must not expose them to further harm. At each step of the case management process, you must ensure that children and their families are not armed as a result of your conduct, the decision you make or the actions taken to support the child and family. Secondly, there is the best interest of the child. This principle is based on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and it makes it's clear that any decision should be made with the best interest of the child in mind. There is rarely an ideal situation, but the least harmful way forward is likely to be the right way to go. Thirdly, there is the principle of non-discrimination. As frontline workers, you must provide the same quality of service to all children and their caregivers, regardless of their status, origin, or any other factor. It is equally important that you adhere to ethical standards to ensure that the rights of the child are protected through your actions. Most of you probably work in settings where there are clear professional ethical standards and codes of conduct that must be applied and observed. There are also international norms and standards like the principles we're going through right now and oftentimes national child protection policies in place. One such ethical standard and a guiding principle for doing case management work is that you must seek informed consent and informed assent. As a frontline worker, you must ensure that children and their families duly and fully understand the services and options available, as well as the benefits and risk of receiving those services. Children and their families or caregivers should also be informed of what information will be collected during the case management process 
how it will be used and the confidentiality of the data. It is important that you communicate all these aspects to the children in a childly, in a child-friendly manner and that they, they and their families or caregivers are encouraged to ask questions and discuss the options. As children cannot provide any consent and informed consent, you should explain the services in a child-friendly manner with the use of an age-appropriate language that the child who is old enough can understand to agree and participate in the services. This is called informed assent. Remember also that there are cases of violence, exploitation, abuse and neglect where the child and their families will not give their informed consent. For example, a young child who is being sexually abused by a caregiver is in need of immediate protection need. In such cases, you cannot ignore what happened and should inform authorities and agencies who have the mandate to take action. It is also important that you respect confidentiality. Any information related to the case should only be shared on a need-to-know basis. This means that information is only shared to those selected individuals who require this information to help protect the child. It is essential that any data about the child is collected, stored and shared in ways that are in line with the agreed data protection policies. This is also a key aspect of child safeguarding policies. Lastly, we must always consider the principle of child participation. You must provide children with the time, space and opportunity to participate in the case management process and the decision making. Every child has a right to express opinions about their experiences and to participate in decisions that affect their lives. The active participation of children also helps nurture and help provide a sense of control. Due to COVID-19, frontline workers face increased challenges for the provision of social work, with, which also expose them to additional stressors, including, but not limited to, working long hours without adequate resources or protection, if, even if it, not, if it is not recommended, dealing with stigma and discrimination due to working in a COVID-19 environment, adhering to strict biosecurity measures, including the wearing of personal protection equipment, in other words, PPE. To effectively support the well-being of those you interact with and might have to support, you must first look after yourself and your own well-being. Additional information on basic psychosocial skills and methods to deal with stress are also provided at the end of this module. Now, let us speak in more detail about the steps involved in the case management process and how you should integrate MHPSS into case management. Please keep in mind that the steps I'm going to present are not linear. After you've assessed the need, after you've assessed the need, design a plan and implement it, you might need to do additional assessments and revise the case plan again. The progression of any single case is dependent on the need of the individual child. So once again, a case management process is not linear and you might have to come back to the assessment and reviewing the plan throughout the process. So let us start by the first step, identification. The case management process starts when a vulnerable child is identified. 
You might have identified the case by yourself, or perhaps the case has been referred to you by another agency. In other circumstances, the parents of, or the community may come to you asking for assistance and help. Of course, you might immediately see that a child needs urgent assistance. The child might, for example, need medical care and you should refer the child to the hospital. The child might also show signs of serious emotional distress that uh, you can address through psychosocial first aid. Another child might show signs of severe malnutrition and should be provided with nutritional support. In such cases, you should ensure that those urgent needs are met first. If you feel that you do not have the capacity to assist the child or that based on an initial assessment, the child might benefit from the services of another organization, you should immediately explain the situation to the child and, and his family um, and, and uh, care providers and provide information about that service and refer the case to another organization. If you feel that uh, you have the capacity to proceed, you will register the case through an identification form provided by your organization and proceed to the next step, provided by your organization and ideally within uh, the existing child protection system uh, at a uh, national level. So the second step of the case management process is the assessment. At this stage, at this stage, you should gather and analyze information about the child's situation, the risk faced, as well as the protective factors, such as the social uh, support available. When you carry out the assessment, always remember that certain children are more vulnerable than others and that their needs will differ. For example, the protection risks are different between boys and girls and the age of the child will also affect the needs. Children living with disabilities might require additional support and might be more vulnerable and exposed to violence and neglect. The information you gather during the assessment is what you will use to inform the design of the case plan and the recommended interventions for the child. Make sure that you engage in a child-friendly manner. There are two sorts of assessments, the initial assessment and the comprehensive assessment. So the initial assessment should ideally take place within the 24 uh, hours, within the 24 hours after identification and re registration, and no later than 84 hours after the identification. This initial assessment can sometimes or often actually be made during the registration process to identify urgent needs and life-threatening life -threatening situations such as a child in need of urgent medical attention. A comprehensive assessment provides a more in-depth and holistic view of the child's situation. The comprehensive assessment looks beyond just the basic information, immediate, sorry, the, the comprehensive assessment looks beyond just the basic and immediate needs of the child and does not only look at the potential risk but also at the protective factors. The comprehensive assessment is the foundation of all good case management work. The wishes and opinions of the child must be thought and taken into consideration when making decisions about the case plan. 
So during the comprehensive assessment, you should look at the child development's need, the parenting skills and capacities of the caregivers, the presence of other supportive adults, the availability for the family and the child, and other, uh, sorry, the presence of other supportive adults, the availability of assistance for the family and the child, and other protective mechanisms in the community. The living conditions of the family and the opportunities for the child to attend school. The lens to conduct a comprehensive assessment will differ between cases. Some children will require more time to share information with you and you must not rush into a decision that, are, that is not in the best interest of the child. To gather the information for your assessment, you can use a variety of sources and tools. For example, you can look at existing reports and information about the child. You can make your own observations and conduct several inter interviews with the child and their families and even within the community. One way of conducting the assessments, case plan design and regular monitoring of the case client is to work within a multi-sectorial case management team. The team can include healthcare workers, social workers, psychiatrists and others who can jointly assess the psychological needs or psychosocial needs, rather, of the child and discuss the case. A child in need of MHPSS services can show many different types of signs and uh, sym symptoms of stress, inclu including uh, constant crying, uh, lack of energy and tiredness, showing signs of neglect, being unable to focus and being absent-minded. A child can also avoid contact with others and experience nightmares and, and or wetting the bed. So the severity of such signs and the overall well-being of the child will help you inform the appropriate level of MHPSS support. A child experiencing mild or few signs of stress might <clears throat> perhaps require basic support through community-based recreational activities to meet their needs. Um, a child who is avoiding contact with other people and refuse to eat will likely need more specialized services. Once the assessment has been completed, a case plan should be developed and used to inform what actions will take place to meet the identified needs of the child as well as who should provide the interventions. Based on the assessments and the identified needs of the child, the case plan needs to consider the short-term, medium-term and long-term actions needed to promote the well-being of the child. Make sure to fully involve the child and family in the development of the case plan. The case plan that you will establish should clearly indicate what will happen, who should do it and what services will be provided, when it would be done and how the case would be followed up. If you're going to provide basic psychosocial support through community-based support mechanisms, this should be clearly stated in the case plan. During the assessment phase, you could have identified already existing social supports available through the community which you can encourage the child and caregivers to utilize. But you can also formally refer the child to such community-based activities. If you've identified a child experiencing serious psycho psychological distress or mental health disorder, you must include 
all the necessary documentation related to the referral, including the informed consent and the referral forms. It is important that you do not try to diagnose mental health conditions. Those who are showing more severe and serious signs of distress should be referred to mental health professionals for a thorough analysis of needs. In order for you to develop a case plan which is in line with the identified needs and in the best interest of the child, you must not only know what level of image process service the child needs, you must also know who can provide the service and how to refer the case. So make sure that you're aware of the referral pathway, the standard operating procedures for making referrals. So now let's speak about referrals. By making a referral, you link the child to the necessary services. This process of directing the child to another service provider, because the child requires help that is beyond your expertise or scope of work, is necessary to avoid causing the child any harm. Not only should children experiencing mental health conditions or disorders be treated by mental health professionals, but it is equally important that you seek the professional support by the trained mental health professionals when assessing the needs and relevant support for a child who appears to be in serious distress. In order for referrals of MHPSS services to work, you must be familiar with the services offered by other service providers and the staff providing those services. If you have not done so yet, please engage with the relevant MHPSS coordination providers in your area, work with your organization and or the MHPSS coordination mechanism, to map the existing MHPSS services, specialized and non-specialized services, so that you're aware of who can contact for referring, of who you can contact for make the, the referring assessment of needs and implementation of support services. This will also make sure that everyone involved in the case management process can harmonize the use of assessment and referral forms. So you should always provide information to the person you will refer and to their caregivers about the service you are going to provide. So you should explain what the service is, where the service is located, how the person can get there, and why you recommend them to get this service. You should think, seek, sorry, you should seek the informed consent uh, of the child or the informed assent rather of the child and, uh, and if available, the consent of the caregiver. And if face-to-face -face contact is limited or impossible, you can make referrals remotely over the phone, via email, or through other electronic means. In such cases, ensure that you obtain verbal consent from the person on and or their caregiver. Just like any other referral within the case management process, you will still need to follow up on the case to ensure that the referral was successful and conduct further assessments to see whether the needs of the child and surrounding community and family is being met or if there are additional needs that require support. If there are no additional concerns, the case can be closed. If there are new concerns, you, you should update the case plan accordingly to provide the appropriate services to ensure the well-being of the child. Let us now switch to the implementation of the case plan. Depending on the image PSS needs of the child and your level of expertise and training, it is likely that you can directly provide the services described in the first two layers of the MHPSS pyramid. 
Most children and adults will recover from trauma and stress if their basic needs are met. If you facilitate their active participation in the case management process and make sure that the basic needs are met, you will make a positive impact on their psychosocial well-being. By using child-friendly communication, providing advice on daily challenges and be, being a resource for the child and family during your interactions, you are providing a very simple form of psychosocial support in line with what is described in layer one of the MHPSS pyramid. The second layer of interventions of the MHPSS pyramid targets those children and caregivers who exhibit social or psychological risk factors associated with mental health, emotional or behavioral disorders. A child in need of this level of support might have experienced increased level of stress due to school closures during the COVID-19 pandemic. This child can be provided with community-based interventions that aim to strengthen the child's resilience and mental well-being through support groups for children and group-based recreational activities, for example, provided through child-friendly spaces. For the children who are in need of more focused support, it is important that this service is provided by those who have been trained, trained of, uh, on uh, psychological first aid, PFA, and how to provide targeted and structured activities. When developing the case plan for children who are presenting behavioral problems or signs of serious psychological distress, it is recommended that they are supported by social service professionals who have been trained on specialized care, psychological first aid, or basic mental health care. As mentioned at the beginning of this module, the fourth layer of the MHPSS pyramid of intervention represent the small but important part of the population who, despite the support already mentioned, may have significant difficulties in basic daily fun functioning and have diagnosable mental health condition, conditions or disorders. Once you've identified a child or a family member who needs this type of specialized MHPSS services, it is absolutely essential that you keep the do no harm principle in mind. This is because it is vital that those who need specialized mental health services are provided specialized care by trained mental health professionals. Just like any need identified during the assessment phase, which lies beyond your expertise or area of work, you will need to formally refer the case to the appropriate service provider. In case you come across someone who is showing signs of severe distress and signs of mental disorder, you can provide psychological first aid to help alleviate the most accurate needs uh, of um, the most accurate distress in short term. But for the long-term well-being of the person, the clinical management of their mental health condition should only be carried out by the trained professionals. If you have not been trained on the provision of PFA to alleviate the most urgent distress, or not been trained on any sort of basic psychosocial support service, it is absolutely essential that you refer the children to service providers that have this capacity. Now we're going to speak about follow-up and review. So regardless of whether you provide the service needed uh, or if you've referred the, the child to another service provider, you should follow up to make sure that the child and their family are receiving the appropriate services to meet their needs as outlined in the case plan. 
It is essential that you follow up in order to find out if the case plan is working. Following up can be seen as a form of continuous assessment of the child's needs and it will help you identify any changes in a child or family circumstances which will require you to review and change the case plan. You can follow up by home visits, phone calls and by checking with the community members and other service providers. Based on the needs of the child and the changing circumstances, you might need to review the case plan to ensure that the case plan continues to be relevant and that the services provided meet the child needs. Now, about case closure. The final step in a case management process is case closure. Cases can be closed after the goals of the child and, uh, and, and families and caregivers, as outlined is in the case plan, have been met. And when the care and well-being of the child is being supported without any additional concerns. Cases can also be closed because the child refuse, refuses uh, the case management services, or rather that the family refuses access to the management services. Cases can also be transferred to another caseworker should the child move to another area. Transfers can also take place where the original caseworker or agency are no longer placed to lead, manage and coordinate the handling of the child's case. Before we round up this module, it is worth taking a few minutes to talk about remote case management. We know that the, cost, the, the, we know that the, the context you're working uh, affect your ability to do case management as normal, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of you will work in countries where there are more strict containment measures in place that limits your mobility. On top of this, some of this, some of you might already work in humanitarian or conflict settings where there are already challenges in conducting face-to-face -face case management due to access constraints. Those of you working in conflict settings with limited access might already have experience in providing remote case management. Some of you who come from settings where there are no conflict or emergencies might have little or no experience at all in providing remote case management, perhaps because you've always been able to move around freely without concern for your well-being and without access constraints to the population. So the issue of uh, remote case management is especially relevant now during the COVID-19 pandemic, when it is not always safe or allowed to conduct face-to-face -face meetings and case management. If you've never provided case management before, this might feel like a drastic change. For those working in humanitarian settings, it might be less of a transition in working modalities but a major shift towards the use of mobile communication could mean that those who do not have access to mobile phones of internet might become even harder to reach. Social workers uh, have been forced to adapt and make use of modern communication tools to conduct the case management work. Remote case management can be provided through the use of phones, WhatsApp, Skype, and other online communication tools. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the shift towards remote case management has implications for both new and existing cases. It is important to note that it might not be possible or desirable to completely shift the provision of case management services to remote modalities. Children and families considered to be high risk or in need of more specialized services might require home visits 
while other cases might not. A combination of face-to-face -face and remote case management is likely needed for many existing or new cases, and you should always adapt the modality of service provision based on the best interest of the child. You should work with partners to establish clear protocols for how existing cases are handled and make clear what kind of services can be provided uh, remotely and which one will need to continue on a face-to-face -face basis. Through discussions with the child, family and other service providers, assess the needs of the child and update the case plan accordingly. Take time to discuss with the family on how you can adapt the case plan. Do not simply assume that all cases can be handled remotely. For example, some children or families might not have access to a mobile phone and cannot be provided with counselling over the phone. In other cases, you can work with the child, the family and the MHPSS service provider to adapt the case plan and shift the face-to-face -face counselling sessions to phone-based counselling. In another case, a child experiencing violence or neglect might not feel comfortable to speak about this situation over the phone, possibly with the responsible perpetrator in the close vicinity or in control over the phone. One way you can try to mitigate this is to provide the child with a safe word that can be used in case they feel unsafe and would rather not speak anymore. Perhaps the child requires you to continue to do face-to-face -face visits. Another implication of remote case management is that the services with, with which the child needs might not be available due to the COVID-19 related restrictions. It is important that you keep yourself updated on what services in your area are not available and it is important that you assess the needs of the children impacted by any such event. You will need to adapt the provision of MHPSS services based on the type of services that are available in light of the national COVID-19 containment strategies. There are many more considerations and aspects of remote case management that we currently have time for, but there are few considerations for when you are following up on an existing case through case management. For example, make sure to ask if the child is comfortable speaking to you. Explain why you're contacting, contacting them remotely and for how long you expect the call to last. Agree on a safe word or a code that can be used if they feel unsafe and would rather not speak anymore. Ask for content, ask for consent repeatedly. Provide updated information on the currently available services. Make the necessary referrals when applicable and manage expectations regarding service provision due to the current situation, highlighting that delays are highly likely. Discuss the well-being of the child and whether there are any immediate needs that must be addressed and which referrals should be prioritized accordingly. If you're contacting children and caregivers in a newly registered case, you should explain who you are and where you're calling, seek informed consent, try to understand why the child called you or has been referred to you, assess the situation and needs of that child, make sure that you are sitting in a quiet place and that no one can overhear you. Make sure that the child is comfortable to speak to you over the phone. You can also suggest that the child 
use a safe word if not feeling safe. And you should assure the child that you're committed to supporting him or her. As a caseworker, you need to ensure that you have a fully, uh, a form fully charged and topped up with enough credit. You should also make sure that the child and family have the relevant numbers to contact you. If you conduct your work from home, you need to ensure that there is a secure place when you can safely store the confi confidential information and a place where no one can hear you talk to the child. There are many practical tips on how to provide remote case management and services remotely, and these above are only a few considerations. But just like any case, but just like in any case management process, you should always apply your expertise to systematically assess the needs of the child and coordinate the provision of the services required to ensure the protection and well-being of the child. Any additional resources on the implementation and adaptation of MHPSS activities for children, adolescents and families, including through direct or remote delivery, is provided um, uh, through uh, this uh, module, at the end of this module, and all is also available uh, in the UNICEF COVID-19 operational guidance for implementation and adaptation of MHPSS activities. We are getting to the end of the module presentation. I hope you've enjoyed this moment. Before we finished, I would like to bring to your attention that there are currently ongoing initiatives under development that will help strengthening the MHPSS integration in case management systems and processes. Indeed, we are aware that there are currently limited resources, tools and operational training materials which provide practical guidance of how frontline workers can address the complex MHPSS needs of children with protection concerns through the integration of MHPSS in case management. Be reassured that we're continuously working to mitigate the situation and develop more operational and ready to use tools. For instance, UNICEF, in collaboration with its partners, has just started to develop an operational framework to strengthen the integration of MHPSS in case management. This should help ameliorate the way you address the increasingly complex MHPSS needs of children with protection concerns, children with development, intellectual and behavioral problems, and other mental issues that affect their well-being. Stay tuned. <laughs>